Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Montpelier City Hall for the uh, two forums we have today uh, sponsored by the Montpelier Rotary Club. I'm Joe Choquette, one of the organizers for the Rotary Club. In the first uh, session here, we have the three candidates for mayor, Carlton Anderson, Dan Jones, and Jack McCullough. Uh, I want to thank uh, ORCA for their generosity in telecasting this event. Uh, it'll be available live now and later on YouTube. Um, I want to thank The Bridge for being our co-sponsor and collaborator. And I want to thank the City of Montpelier for the use of their uh, nice space. Um, with that, uh, our moderator for this afternoon's forums is Cassandra Hemingway. Cassandra has been in Vermont since 1994. She's unfortunately not a native, so we can't claim her. But uh, she came to Vermont and she uh, uh, worked for a number of years for the uh, for the Distinguished Hardwood Gazette, which is one of our uh, very uh, best weeklies in the state. She uh, worked in Montpelier uh, in, in the Central Vermont region for a period of time uh, with the Central Vermont Solid Waste District. Um, and recently she has, uh, recently, um, now is with The Bridge where she was recently elevated to Editor-in-Chief. So uh, Cassandra is going to be our moderator and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, and thanks again to the Rotary Club. Um, this is a great service to the community to um, provide a way for folks to hear from the candidates. I'm not going to take too much time before we introduce our candidates, but I do want to just go over the format for everybody. Um, this is a forum. It's not a debate. So each candidate will be asked the same question, and they'll each be given the same amount of time to answer. It will be 90-second answer times. And we have a timekeeper here who will keep folks on track. I may have to, if it goes over, I may have to cut you off. So I'm going to give you a heads up ahead of time. Um, I will be introducing the candidates in order, alphabetical order by last name. But after that, I'll refer to everybody by your first name. Um, and they'll each have 90 seconds for a introductory um, comment. We'll get to hear a little bit about them and why they're running. Um, so let's get into it. We'll start with Carlton Anderson. Carlton is a truck driver, a poet. He works in software. Um, he's been in the central Vermont area for about 21 years. And um, I'd love to hear more about you, Carlton. Hi, thank you. I'd, if you'd like to come in, I'd, I'd, I won't, I certainly won't. Okay. Um, so my, my name is Carlton Anderson. Uh, like Cassandra said, I moved to the Valley 21 years ago um, after the August blackout uh, that occurred. Um, I was looking for simplicity um, and also a way of life that um, Vermont met for me. Um, I worked at Sugarbush for 10 years um, during the transition uh, with Wynn uh, from American Ski Company. Um, also, I've been to the Bluetooth if those of you know who that uh, know what that is, uh, that's an inside thing for uh, ski bums. Um, I am a software uh, person. My father worked for IBM for 48 years, uh, so they've always been in my life. I've been able to pick them up and put them down, um, and have not always rode the waves of uh, what the internet surfs. Uh, so I'm just asking for an opportunity to be your mayor. Um, I've understood the infrastructure, uh, being a truck driver. I understand the fact that Montpelier is 8,004 people. Uh, there are some things that we do have to uh, be cognizant of, being that it is the state capital. Um, however, trucking across the country and falling in love with it, the amber waves of grain, I'm sorry, the Purple Mountains of Majesty and the amber waves of grain, uh, it's true. And thank you, it says stop. <laughs> Thank you, Carlton. Dan Jones is a, another candidate for mayor. Um, Dan is, uh, has been a Montpelier resident for 15 years. He's the founder of Sustainable Montpelier. He spearheaded the My Ride and the 2016 Sustainable Montpelier Design Competition. Um, Dan, tell us why you're running. Well, thanks, Cassandra. That uh, gave me a, a little bit of leg up on the resume. Uh, I'm running this year again, I, I tried it last year, uh, because a number of the issues that I tried to bring up last year have not been resolved and to some degree have gotten worse. 
So I believe that it is time that our city begins to deal with some of the critical issues that are now facing us. We can begin to see them already uh, this spring in the middle of winter, um, where we can expect 60 degrees on town meeting day, where we've had two, um, uh, one almost flood and one devastating flood in the past year. So climate change, economic change, and uh, political change is going to be a hallmark of our future. And if we don't start making the kind of public presentation preparations that are going to be required to meet that, we're going to be failing our citizens because we won't have the capacity to actually uh, move into this threatened future with any kind of strength or resolve. So I am hoping that uh, in this contest uh, today we can begin to start talking about the kind of challenges that the city faces, what we have realistically to be able to do, what we can't realistically do, and where we can find other resources to help and what we got to do. So I think this is a uh, exciting time to try and make shifts in town. I'm running against the status quo. I'm not running against the people because I think the status quo has not been serving us well recently, and I think it's time to uh, begin to shift our ideas and our approach to the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And Jack McCullough, he's our current mayor. He's the incumbent candidate, um, been mayor for a year, served on city council for, I don't want to get this wrong, is it five years? Five, five years. years. Um, a mental health law project, uh, and sorry, an attorney at the Mental Health Law Project, and Jack has been in town since 1983. Jack, uh, tell us more about yourself and why you're running. Thank you. As we sit here in February, we're f faced with both challenges and opportunities, and if we meet both of those effectively, we can look forward to a healthier and more prosperous capital city. Our number one challenge, of course, is to continue to work on flood recovery the city will, must and will continue to work with residents and businesses to assure that their futures are secure. Our next challenge and opportunity is to move forward with housing, mm -hmm. and specifically housing development on Country Club Road. Last week, the council approved the next steps on, in this process, and I intend to move forward with what is clearly the best option for major housing development for our city. Third, we must continue to address the infrastructure issues that uh, have faced our city. We've fully fund funded the capital plan in next year's budget so that we can continue road repairs and maintenance. In addition, last week the council unanimously approved a plan that will resolve most the most vulnerable water mains within 10 years and within our current budgeting policies. Finally, fiscal responsibility. This year's budget fully funds our capital plan, retains the fire department at full strength, and holds our budget increase below the rate of inflation. It was not easy to achieve this, and it has involved some painful cuts, but working with city leaders, we were able to do that. And I hope to talk about some of these issues as we go forward today. Thank you, Jack. And that's a great segue into my first question for the three of you. Um, and as an aside, the way I'll be um, calling on each of you is I'll start again in alphabetical order, and then I, um, I have a system for um, changing up who goes first, so everybody gets a different chance to be first and last in the question. So um, let's talk about um, infrastructure. Um, how can we deal with our deteriorating infrastructure and also hold down property taxes, Carlton? And also hold down property taxes. Very interesting. Um, well, you know, I, I tend to look at things as a poet, and that happens in a way where you have to look at it in a micro and macro outcome and view. Um, 700,000 miles trucking around the country. When I think of infrastructure, I, I think of all the cities that I, I saw. Um, that were causing traffic jams that you can't even imagine, uh, but they were doing it. And so infrastructure here in Montpelier specifically, um, it's, a, it's, a mic, it's a macro issue. Um, you know, we, we can't fix Montpelier by itself. Uh, and so it, it will provide, it, it will be uh, something that we're gonna have to um, really think about on a level where we look within, but we also find the synergistic opportunities to save money and also headache with other communities that have done it before us. We're answering a lot of questions 
or attempting to answer a lot of questions uh, in a way where there are things that have been already done um, for other people. Um, and so when, when you say infrastructure, I, I feel like I, I'm, there's a lot to that. I don't want to promise any carrots um, because that can happen. Um, however, it's a matter of willpower um, and also finding, as usual, other streams of revenue so that we're not taxing our people. Thank you, Carlton. Dan, how do you propose um, dealing with our infrastructure and keeping property taxes down or at a minimal increase? And how many 90 seconds? Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I was delighted to see that there was actually some motion on the issue of the water system in the city council last week. Uh, we started a group called uh, Resilient Montpelier uh, about a year and a half ago, specifically with one of the goals was to start t paying attention to our failing water system. Um, so I'm happy to see that's had some effect over time, uh, so I will congratulate us. Uh, when you look at the system, however, it's still, and what they're proposing is still a very narrow frame, which I do, do not want to stop anything. I think it's wonderful. But what I understand uh, from others is that there is a lot of potential resources with federal and state resources that we have not and we failed to tap into. One of the uh, ways that I've learned about this is uh, by talking to uh, Mr. Nagy, who had been the engineer with Department of Environmental Conservation last year, who said the city had failed to even come to them where they could actually have helped find water resource money. Um, so it turns out that we, uh, we have failed in the ability to go looking for the resources uh, and to really figure out what it means. Because when you talk about roads, well, you can't do the roads until you've done the water system because if you're going to have to dig up the uh, water and sewer pipes. You, uh, you're going to have to live with the bad roads for longer. We don't really have a system that's going forward with uh, the kind of speed and dynamics that I think is required. And so uh, I think it's finding those resources from elsewhere is going to be the key to holding the taxes down on this because it's a big number. It's been estimated somewhere around $80 million. And so I think we have to pay attention to it in a big way. Thank you, Dan. Jack, uh, why don't you talk about how we can address infrastructure and property taxes? Sure. Infrastructure is one of the things that we hear about from city council all the time because everybody drives on the roads. Everybody knows how it affects them. And uh, it, ro road repairs, road conditions are, are kind of like fireworks. What you see is a direct uh, function of the money that you put into the system. And uh, what we've done this year for the first time since before the pandemic is to fully fund our capital plan. And that's important. And uh, nobody on council even considered uh, cutting that because people recognize how important it is. We will continue to do that, and we probably could uh, could stand to expand the capital plan, but it's a matter of how do you balance that against uh, other needs. I should point out that over the last few years, and this was in the city manager's weekly report from two weeks ago, uh, we had a rundown of all the grants from city, state, and other or state, federal government, and other uh, sources in the last three years, and it's about $9 million. So we've really done quite a good job of, uh, of bringing in outside, outside non-tax funds. The, uh, the water system, we got off to a tricky start with the water system because of our communications with the state. We are now at a point where we're ready to move forward, and we will uh, as I said, address the uh, the main water main issues within uh, within ten years and ten million dollars, which is within the plan that we would have been bud budgeting for water system for the next ten years anyway. So taxes are always a pressure. We are going to continue to work to improve infrastructure and do what we can to uh, control taxes. Thank you, Jack. Um, so follow-up question to that. Um, do we need to cut any more city programs or staff to pay for infrastructure? Um, 
And I realize we have been talking about grants, but um, we have seen a, an austere budgeting year this year. Um, will we need to see even more cuts in the future? And if so, what do you propose would be cut? Um, and we will start with Dan. I would like to answer that question about do we have to cut staff. I think that is something we have to look at. I don't have an answer for you right now. Uh, I would like to have a closer look with the council at that. I think one of the things that we can understand is perhaps we have to make better use of the staff. In other words, my, my feeling is that like, uh, you know, in our administrative personnel, we could have more time being spent trying to find the serious money that could be found in the feds for the infrastructure. I believe we have to spend more time with our uh, administrative staff figuring out what are the things that are actual priorities because the city manager establishes the priorities. I think what is, has to happen now is that the council has to be a lot more closely uh, focused on what the priorities are rather than in broad terms but in much more specific terms and I think our council is capable of it uh, I think there's a lot of good people but that's where we have to make those decisions so that rather than saying I will cut this and this and this right now I would rather say what are we how are we looking at that together with the council uh, how do we make those priorities and how are those then established with the administration this is not going to be easy stuff. There's a lot of sacred cows that uh, have to be maintained in the city uh, in terms of various programs. And so determining which is going to go and which is not going to go is uh, a difficult public dis uh, discussion. It is not going to be just glibly say, oh, we'll cut this and this. So that's where I stand. Thank you. Jack. A couple of points. First is that uh, you should keep those signs for council meetings, too. <laughs> Uh, first, um, we need to re re recognize, and everyone in the city needs to recognize, that the budget problems that we had this year, and, and last year too, we had another no, no new programs budget last year, but the budget that we're facing with was not a one-year thing. It's, uh, we got through 2023 and the flooding, but uh, we can expect that things will be tight for uh, a few years into the future. We were not treating our, this year's budget as a one-time get through it and return to normal uh, budget this year. Second, the sad fact is that we have already cut staff and uh, we had a hiring freeze uh, for most of the time since, uh, since the flood in the proposed budget. We've had to cut staffing that, uh, that people really value. For instance, the uh, AmeriCorps uh, workers and the uh, Montpelier Youth Conservation Corps workers in the uh, rec department, or rec, parks department, sorry. And uh, we've already cut, made other cuts. We'll, we're making cuts within uh, administration and uh, we have restricted, made cuts in, uh, in budgeted overtime of city staff. Um, I don't think we have people in the city government who are sitting around doing nothing, who are not uh, productively contributing to the operations and well-being of the city. And so I hope to avoid staff cuts. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Um, so as mayor, um, what leadership would you... <gasps> I skipped Carlton. I apologize. <laughs> Thank you for sitting there so calmly. Well, I'm I just the invisible man. Right Don't by. worry about it. <laughs> okay, Carlton, please speak to how you would uh, approach budgeting. I, I mean, it, a lot of these things are being um, looked at and decided from a very privileged perch. And, you know, if you know struggle and know triumph and uh, recognize how to survive in a way that is productive and meaningful, it translates into what we're trying to do here. As far as, you know, I, I, I'm, it feels like a gotcha question, but I'm, I'm just going to be honest uh, with you. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you right now um, who would cut, who, who we would cut, who we not, it, whether that is an issue is, or uh, whether that is a, um, you know, something that, I'm sorry, it's a hot but a button issue within uh, Montpelier because our, you know, our jobs are very important to us and um, 
you know, I can tell you that I've looked at a lot of the lines, a lot of the grand list. I've looked at uh, the school board um, as well, even though I don't have children. Uh, and, you know, uh, and I have no, I wouldn't have any say in the school board. Um, there, there's some excess um, from a focal granularity uh, standpoint that we would have to educate each other uh, to understand. And what I bring to this is ultra transparency. You just, it won't be cut for, and no one know why. Um, and, and it'll be clearly defined without bumper stops. Thank you, Carlton. Um, our next question is, um, as mayor, what leadership would you provide to the homeless issue in Montpelier? And we'll start this one with Jack. Thank you. This is uh, one of the uh, one of the top priorities of the city council for this year, and it will continue to be so. We have uh, have to recognize that. Uh, Anyone living in the city is a member of our community, whether they uh, have permanent housing or not. Um, we have been working uh, from year to year on uh, with the agencies that provide services. You know, this is not something that the city of Montpelier can figure, well, we're gonna open up a new city staffed program. But, but uh, the city has been working for the last few years with uh, Good Samaritan Haven and another way to uh, to provide housing uh, or shelter uh, for our homeless uh, citizens. We need to continue to do that, and we need to improve that because what we've been doing is looking year to year where are we going to put people this year? What's going to happen after that? We really need to have uh, a permanent uh, shelter location somewhere in, in the city, preferably downtown, in walking distance to other uh, facilities and services. And so I know there are discussions going on uh, about that, and we need to continue to make that a, a reality. Thank you. Carlton. On this issue, I'm, I'm the only one up here who uh, has and continue to um, experience unhoused insecurity. Um, I've been guilty of making um, being poor look very good um, because I've come from upper middle class. Uh, however, I have been home insecure since I was 17. Um, as we often know, um, it's do as I say, not as I do, and so therefore it's the highway or my way, not or you know what I'm saying, and I. And I chose to be a truck driver after being a, a, a software and snowboarding you know, person. I'm, I'm a normal person. And what I'm, what I'm seeing is um, it, we're making Montpelier, uh, Ash, Asheville, North Carolina. We're making it Sedona, Arizona. And we're making Barrie the bedroom community for the working and underprivileged. And that should not be. I want, to, I want to live here. I want everyone to be able to prosper here. And I want everyone to understand that money used responsibly is not a negative thing. Thank you, Carlton. Dan. Okay, this is probably the most intractable problem that we face uh, right now because as the economy implodes uh, where fewer and fewer people can afford the housing that's available because uh, incomes are not keeping up with uh, costs, we have an expansion, constant expansion in the homeless population. Uh, they come to Montpelier because services are available. Um, so if you can imagine like a funnel uh, from our whole region that if there's any prob people with problems, they flow into Montpelier. They don't stay in Cabot or Callis or uh, Worcester because there are no services there. Okay, so Montpelier then uh, has to take on a role of providing services and help and aid to this uh, population without any benefit of support from either the uh, surrounding towns or even much of the state. And I think that's one of the uh, real 
catastrophes of the whole homeless thing is that our state is failing to step up to the plate and help with the homeless problem and providing the services. I believe that it is time to start recommitting ourselves to finding more services, more, I'm sorry, more resources that can be brought to the situation. And that isn't going to happen just out of our tax base. We have to find other ways of doing it. Finally, Okay, and quite simply, I do think that the city could afford to put in a couple of public restrooms on State Street, and I think that it's something that would make lives of the homeless in town a lot easier. So I am a supporter of that and would like to even see more in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, and this is kind of a follow-up question. Um, what is your position on co-locating a homeless shelter at the Berry Street Recreation Center? Um, I'll leave it at that. And um, we'll start with Jack for this question. Oh, oh did I just? I was first last time. Oh, I'm so sorry. Carlton. We'll start with Carlton. Rolling with the punches. <laughs> um, you know, there's 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 so many buzzwords going on in my mind as far as this is concerned because it's such a hotbed issue. Yet it's a NIMBY thing. Um, and you know, we 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 have the rec center, um, which is is adequate. But what happens to the ping pong players? Um, what, what happens to uh, pickleball players? Um, you know, no, no one really, you know, w within the recreation, those people will deem that important that they still have that uh, area uh, or that place to recreate. Um, I, I'd have to really talk to a lot of people. I feel um, um, expert at uh, what's going on uh, more um, because with Confluence Park being uh, what it is, you know, if we build anything at Confluence Park, Down Street may, like, no, may not like it because of the deck would imp impede on the view of the people of Down Street. Yet, if we, if we think, if we need something immediate, um, you know, some of the issues are, are, are just, it's willpower. Um, you know, one of the things I believe is we should move uh, Confluence Park out to uh, on, on the past where the uh, water, uh, our water uh, works is, and build what I call um, decency depots. Um, as a truck driver, there's, there's showers all over the country that can withstand the anger of a truck driver and the loneliness of a truck driver. And so, therefore, we have options. Thank you, Carlton. Um, Dan. I understand the impetus behind it. I also understand that our community really needs the recreation capacity downtown. So this becomes an area where I think we need a more vigorous public debate on the issue because we have not, you know, we're sort of assigning things, but a lot of people are saying this is awful, this is awful. Uh, right now, because we have an emergency, I don't think we have any choice but to use uh, the lower part of the uh, old recreation center for uh, homeless uh, shelter at the moment because we're being overwhelmed by it. And as they end the uh, motel program, we're going to be more flooded uh, with people. Um, this is, not, you know, there's no nice uh, answer to this thing. I think we have uh, now experienced also, uh, and this is where I tried to bring this up initially, a period in which we have declining revenues for all of us, okay? People are complaining about the taxes because they no longer see the taxes coming, the money coming into their own pockets each year that they have in the past. So now we've got to figure out, well, what can we afford in town? You know, what services can we afford? What do we have to uh, look at more broadly? And I think we've been taking on too much stuff. We've every year have been basically checking off every item on the budget list at the town meeting rather than asking some hard questions about what we're choosing or not. And so it is a question not just of what we do with the Recreation Center, but it's a question of what we're doing with all of our resources going forward in order to provide the greatest good for uh, the number of our citizens. Thank you very much. Jack. Thank you. You know, taking two of our most challenging questions and saying, well, we're going to bundle them in one ball. Uh, doesn't doesn't make addressing e either one of them e easier. Um, clearly, the uh, recreation center, the way it is, uh, needs a significant amount of work, and uh, <clears throat> we haven't addressed whether we're going to keep that as permanent recreation or um, put a per uh, permanent recreation center somewhere else. Similarly. Um, as, I, as we were just talking about, services and, and shelter for homeless people 
is uh, is something that has eluded us so far. And uh, creating a, a temporary uh, location in the recreation center is an attractive uh, idea because it's temporary. But I've heard many people who are active users of the rec center saying that please don't do it. It's uh, the uses are incompatible, and in particular, having uh, people having to clear out every day and uh, wh whether there's going to be friction between the users of both of those centers um, makes me think it's not a good long-term uh, solution. But we'll hear from, from the public plenty of times before a decision is made. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Um, okay. So let's talk about housing a little bit. And um, what, tell me about your position on developing Country Club Road property. Um, and we will start with Dan. Um, well, I think they've done uh, a lot of pl expensive planning on it, so I guess there is the city commitment to doing it as quickly as possible. I don't see any developers uh, lining up to uh, want to look at the property, so I think it may be a very expensive red herring that we've dragged across a citizen's uh, road. I don't. Personally, I was not in favor of purchasing it in the first place, so uh, I think we're stuck with it now. Uh, but I would rather not sink any more money into it at the moment because I don't think there's anybody going to show up in this environment, in this economy, who's going to want to put the money in it. The city's going to have to put at least $5 million in just to run a road and uh, water and sewer up there. So it's not like it's a free option even if uh, somebody wanted to do it. Okay, so we have basically boxed ourselves in with that particular choice, uh, you know, of our real estate investment, um, and so, you know, I think it'll go back, back and forth between people in terms of what we're supposed to do with Country Club Road. Like I said, I would just as soon uh, see it uh, be allowed to uh, lay there as a nice recreation site for a while until we see whether the economy improves. My guess is we actually have to look more close down in, on State Street and in the pit for housing options rather than uh, trying to stick it uh, three miles out of town. Thank you. Jack? Housing, for as long as I've li lived here, has been a real issue. And I've looked at various places and thinking, well, when I moved here, I would drive by Sabin's pasture every uh, every day when the uh, when the speedboats were parked uh, along the road, and I thought that would be a great place for housing. And what we found over the years is that a housing strategy of waiting for people who own big tracts of land to put housing on those uh, tracts of land hasn't worked. We don't have the housing that uh, has been talked about in, on Sabin's pasture for many years. And what we've seen, not only in Montpelier, not only in Vermont, but across the country, is that the kind of housing development we need is not going to be provided solely by the private sector. And we need public intervention in the market in order to make it happen. And that's why I was so enthusiastic about uh, Country Club Road. We uh, just this w just last week we unanimously uh, voted to move forward on the plan to, uh, which is laid out by our uh, housing development pro uh, office, which is develop the zoning, zoning, move from there to uh, the growth center designation expansion, and then move to TIF, TIF development so that we can attract private partners. Thank you, Jack. Carlton. You know, when I worked at uh, Vermont State Employee Credit Union 15 years ago, uh, the transit center uh, was uh, just a, a, a the, the land was just a, a piece of land that people were uh, discussing with um, the landowner. Uh, and there were opinions. I, I didn't always, I wasn't always privy to the opinions, but I, as a, like I said, I, you always have to understand as a poet, I feel things. Uh, and uh, I say that to say, uh, some of the things that the mayor uh, spoke about, Saban's Farms, um, also, you know, if, if I'll put even more on it. I'm hesitant to name drop because I, I know um, the culture of our of, of our, our town and 
and um, just human nature. Um, you know, we often can um, uh, be, be clouded by the individuals. And so I'll say that we're growing in a way where we're competing against these private landowners in a way where it's not healthy to ignore them. Uh, and it's, it's best for the greater good if we have a conversation and bring them into the conversation uh, because without them we're going to have difficulty there's a particular landowner that i spoke to for six hours it was expansive and he owns 516 acres in and around montpelier including the land the mayor sp speaks of without talking to him at least for five minutes nothing's going to get done and i know this because i talked to him Thank you, Carlton. Thank you. Okay, let's switch gears. And um, I'd like to hear from each candidate about how you propose we prepare or currently are preparing for future flooding. Um, and we'll start with Jack for this question. Oh, oh did I? Is Dan up? <laughs> I was just up. Oh, okay. You're up. <laughs> okay, sorry, I didn't didn't want to step on anyone's toes. Um, one thing we know for sure is that uh, just like the 1927 flood and the 1992 flood and the 2011 flood, last year's flood isn't going to be the last one we ever have, and and we need to be prepared for that. Uh, uh, after the flood, we moved quickly to establish the uh, Montpelier Commission on Recovery and Resilience to uh, work on on the big issues, to, to address how we can restore uh, downtown, get downtown to, uh, to a safe uh, and flood-proof uh, setting, and how we can work on other issues. Just last week, uh, I recognize people in the room who were at the uh, public forum that the Resilience Commission uh, held. And I thought it was very encouraging that, uh, that this commission, which is going to have to work not only within the city of Montpelier, but with our, our neighboring communities and with the state government and the federal government to address um, all those issues. What are we going to do to keep uh, floodwaters out of downtown? Well, we're making steps on some of those processes already, like the plan to uh, uh, use uh, Home Farm Way for, uh, for flood, uh, flood absorption. But it's, it's going to take a lot, including hardening, flood hardening of downtown. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Carlton, how do you propose we deal with future flooding in Montpelier? We have so many master plans on our uh, website uh, that I don't have to do anything other than put everything in one place for us to vigorously have a discussion, understanding that action is immediate after the discussion. We've had so many talks. I've watched Orca since 2016. I was also here for the flood. I was in, in the valley, excuse me, for the flood in, in, uh, for Irene. I came here because I was working at, in, in, at the Vermont State Employee Credit Union, and Montpelier is my, my this is my, my capital, our capital. I've seen the devastation over and over and over again. I've, I've watched, I'm sorry, I've read, I've gone to the library and read the history of Montpelier. This, we know what to do. It's just a matter of having the willpower to ultimately finally do it. And so the discussions are just that, discussions. And we finally really need to, for the sake of the future, get going with something because we have all the plans. Pick one. Thank you. Dan. Um, I think if you ask uh, the merchants downtown, people on State Street, on Elm Street, uh, they will agree that the city had no response to the flood immediately. 
We had a complete failure of our emergency response plan. It may be a plan on paper, but it was certainly not uh, activated in the streets. Where were the cops helping people get out of their houses early? Where were uh, the warnings? We knew two days ahead of time this was going to be a major event. Okay, I, so my first priority, if uh, elected mayor, will be to start on creating a new emergency response plan that deals with the situation as we have it now. Who's assigned to do what? How do we rehearse it at least once every few months? Who's going to do what when? Okay, that's just the start. Next, we have to start looking at our land use options because we are not going to get out of the floodplain. Uh, as uh, the December almost flood told us, I'll be back. Okay, we are going to have uh, more and more floods more often as climate change takes over. Okay, we have uh, failed to even consider that. We have to start talking with the state. How are we going to re re reuse the land in order to the best effect? Should we be moving, helping to figure out how to move our downtown uh, up into higher ground so that it's not as subject to uh, being destroyed? These are big questions. Yes, I agree the Climate Commission helps. I thought they're actually their work on an emergency response plan was notable, and I want to talk with them more. As far as the other stuff, I think we have a long way to go in the planning, and I look forward to to uh, helping to lead that effort. Thank you. Okay, um, I got everybody right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, no respect to Carl. Okay. <laughs> thanks. Next question is: Do you see the need to increase the diversity of those who are serving in city government, um, both staff members and elected leadership? And if so, what steps need to be taken to include more women, BIPOC folks, and people from different income backgrounds? And we'll start with Carlton. I mean, that's not a question. Um, no, yes. Um, what we should do about it is uh, believe that um, anyone that doesn't look like the people you're used to in power can do the job too. And what I've coined that as is cognitive diversity. And so, yes. What we should do, and also we should be attracting. We should make it. A, we, we should be making comf making it comfortable uh, for individuals. I've, I've lived here for 21 years. I've I've worked in various jobs where it has been not comfortable. Um, this this is a cry for help uh, at this point uh, from the citizens of Montpelier um, that I am someone who should be thought of as. Um, um, you know, a contributor, uh, and people who look like me, um, I, I, you know, w I, it's a given that women, uh, I mean, you know, I'm, 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 I'm part of the marginalized, so if I speak for all of the marginalized without ego, because I understand the power of minds, given the chance to contribute to problems, can solve problems. I went to a conference uh, last week called Sea Change, and it's uh, creative minds and artists putting their minds together to creatively help solve very difficult issues. Sea Change. Thank you. Dan, how would you speak about diversity? Well, one thing is I'd like to uh, congratulate Carlton for stepping up and uh, running for mayor because it changes the uh, the face just of what we've got uh, as an on offer to the city. Um, yes, I think we can have a more um, robust um, minority hiring program within the city government so that we have more v variety of faces uh, that people interact with as they are uh, coming to the city. I think this actually then goes down into the issue of schools of, um, you know, wh what are we teaching? Where are we encouraging people to come along as opposed to saying, well, gee, they haven't shown up, so why aren't they uh, doing anything? We haven't really valued those voices because, well, we're the whitest state in the country. Uh, we, we, uh, we haven't had to. And uh, because of that, we've allowed ourselves to kind of sink into a sort of comfortable uh, demise 
where we're, uh, we're not actually looking at this. So it's a good question. I don't have an immediate answer, but I would like to see, I would like to appear for the high school before others uh, to talk about, well, who's out here who would like to get involved? Because we don't have any um, real priority for people in their lives to serve in government because it's uh, basically thankless and doesn't pay anything. So, uh, you know, how are we going to make a change in those who are going to represent us if we don't make some effort to actually uh, recruit them and educate them. Thank you. Jack. The answer is clearly yes. I think it was a proud moment for Montpelier uh, a few years ago when the majority of our mayor and council were women. It was a proud moment for uh, Montpelier a few years ago when we hired the first black police chief in the state of Vermont. And uh, the commitment is there. We we need to do more to make that happen. We have uh, created a, a committee, the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, that has uh, come forward with a number of uh, proposals to make, uh, to attract uh, diverse volunteers to our commissions and, and committees. Um, one of those has been, or was in the past year, was to offer stipends for people whose uh, economic uh, circumstances might be a barrier to serving on planning commission uh, or any of the other uh, commissions that we have. Unfortunately, in this year's budget, we had to cut that because we were so tight in budget. I think we, before the flood came, one of my plans for, for this past year was to uh, embark on a much more uh, recruiting to, to all our boards and commissions. and. Uh, then the flood kind of got in the way and took up a lot of our time, but that's one of the things that I would plan to do uh, in the coming year as mayor. Thank may I follow you. up, please? May I follow up? Uh, 30 seconds. You, you know, this, this is um, near and dear to my heart, um, and it, it, no one's looking for a handout, um, at least from my perspective. Uh, what what I'm, and I can only speak for myself, although I'm speaking for the macro. Um, what is needed is a, a, a more comfortable environment for BIPOC and uh, the, for the BIPOC community to uh, work. It's never been the job that was difficult for me. It was the personalities uh, that I worked with. So I invite you to go to IamVVermont.com, IamVermont2, and just understand the voices that are saying the same thing I am. Thank you. Thank you, Carlton. Thank you. Um, I um, was wondering if we do have any questions from the audience. Did anybody? Um, I did not let folks know. Sorry. So, if there's any questions from the audience, what I'd love to have you do is just write these down. Maybe you can. Yeah. I'm sorry, we are asking folks to write this down and I apologize that I wasn't more clear about that in the very beginning. Um, at, while people are writing down any questions you might have for the candidates, I'll, I'll go on with one more. Um, as mayor, would you encourage or stay neutral in an exploration of a school district merger or demerger um, if it appears fiscally and educationally benefit beneficial and um, as I'm sure many folks here are aware, the question is being asked because there is conversation going on about shutting down the Roxbury Village School. Um, I realize that's a school board issue. Um, we are looking at a 20 to 24% property tax increase directly related to the schools. So um, I guess I'm asking if there is a role for city leadership in that conversation and what do you envision it to be? Um, and we are starting with Dan for this question. Uh, under the law at the moment, there isn't a role, unfortunately. Uh, you know, there is this clear, bright line between the school committee and the um, 
city council, uh, the, uh, the city administration, which is not to be breached under uh, Vermont law. I think it's a, a bad law, but that's the way it is. Uh, personally, I think we should be uh, looking intensively at merging with U32 as rapidly as possible, uh, move up to the high school uh, because uh, it's above the floodplain, if nothing else, and has much better facilities. Um, we are in a situation in which we are uh, also at victims of the state rules, which were done with the best intentions, but are not actually uh, serving the need for uh, our community. So that I'm hearing a lot of people saying, I'm not sure I can afford to live in Montpelier any longer with the level that taxes are going up. So there's a real fear and destruction that's going on within our community. In terms of the uh, Roxbury School, I was talking to my friend Ken Jones, who used to be on the school committee on, uh, on this, and he said, if you look at the situation up at Elmore, which has one of the most cost-efficient schools in the uh, state, okay, they take their special needs student and send them down to uh, Morrisville, uh, which uh, they could do at uh, Roxbury as well. And the second thing is, we do not need a principal in uh, Roxbury. We can have one of the teachers act as a principal. That will cut the costs immens immensely just by getting rid of the special uh, services and uh, getting rid of the administration overhangs. So that's where I think we have to go. Thank you, Dan. Jack. I've heard the discussion, of course. We all have. And, uh, and the issues are very complicated. Uh, it's I, I think the, uh, we've got two different governmental bodies. We've got the uh, city of Montpelier and we have the uh, Montpelier-Roxbury uh, uh, public schools. And I think it's very hard to say that the city council of the city of Montpelier should be telling the other body what to do, um, particularly when both what we would be talking about doing essentially is talking to the much smaller community of Roxbury and telling them to close your school down when we know how uh, strongly feel pe people feel about their schools. Um, I've always been interested in, uh, in the idea of merging with the U32 district, but I think anyone who thinks that we can do that with uh, the current physical plant without building another school somewhere for, uh, for the people that are going to be mushed into the two districts is kidding themselves because that's not going to happen. But for all, for all those reasons, and how complicated the, uh, the issues are, I, I don't see that the, uh, the city council should, should be doing that. It's, it's enough for us to do the big job we're doing on city council, and I'm not going to tell this uh, school board what to do. Thank you, Jack. Carl? got involved in what you were saying. I apologize. I tried to be fair, honest. Thanks. <laughs> Carlton. Thank goodness we're not Burlington High School, huh? <laughs> anyway, so um, I, I, I attend the school board uh, meetings. I have no children. I've never been married. And so, but, but I do deem it important uh, to uh, attend so I can understand uh, things. I, at, as a person who lives in the community and talks to everyone um, you know I, I I hear the issues from the human perspective and um, you know Roxbury never made any sense to me once I dug into it uh, I, I just felt like Northfield might uh, should have uh, absorbed it but I can understand why we did um, and it was a boom for Roxbury itself as a citizen, but we were we we got absorbed into something that, you know, we we really we, we can't afford any of this stuff. It, it, we're all it, we were buying things prior to the pandemic, prior uh, prior to two floods, and also thinking that you know everything was going to be okay, status quo, uh, if we just keep going with the path that's that's kind of where we are right now we're at a point now where Roxbury the, the citizens of Roxbury need to be drawn in and considered not as an afterthought it needs to have our full attention so that we can actually do something about the situation uh, with all the schools involved if we're going to make if we're I'm thank done. you Carlton that's <laughs> time thank you okay we have a couple questions from the audience um are you open to switching to a strong mayor system, and if so, why? And as a um, 
just a brief explanation, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, strong mayor system would mean, um, I mean the questioner could co correct me too, that we're, the, the mayor has more of the roles and responsibilities that we currently pay a city manager for? Am I, is that accurate question asker? So, okay, I'm not hearing from that person. <laughs> That's okay. Um, let's just stick with the question. Are you open to switching to a strong mayor system, and if so, why? And we're starting with, did we, Carlton? No. The mayor. The mayor. It, we could. Oh, well, when we roll the tape, we'll see this. <laughs> okay. I'm, I think that the, uh, the city manager system that we have has, uh, has served uh, the city of Montpelier very well uh, over the years. What we have... If you look across the state, there are only two cities in the whole state that have a, a strong mayor system, uh, Burlington and Rutland. And uh, I don't think that they do appreciably better than, uh, than Montpelier does. If, any, uh, if anything, I think we compare very well with them. If all the rest of our cities and uh, incidentally, all of our school districts in the state essentially have a system of elected leadership and a professional uh, manager to, to run the system. I think it works well. I, I think that the idea of finding uh, Montpelier residents willing to, uh, who have the skill set to take on a full-time job as, uh, as mayor and, and then budgeting for that uh, job um, I don't think is realistic. Thank you, Jack. Carlton. I think it's realistic. And um, I, I, the city council, uh, or city manager uh, position, and I'll just say his name, Bill Frazier, is the elephant in the room um, in a lot of rooms um, that I, I'm in. Um, I'm running for mayor as well because there's a lot of times we get caught up in the pageantry and the fluff of everything and not realizing what the single most important thing is for the mayor um, is breaking the ties. And um, we need somebody who doesn't uh, have the um, history with some of the legacy issues um, and do the hard thing. I, I'm, I, I'm used to not being liked, um, and so I'm not concerned with that. I'm also used to being held under a microscope, uh, so I'm not, I'm not concerned with that. Um, and so, you know, my purpose of running is to bring the two thirds that didn't pay attention uh, to the table, because we all need to pay attention, and so. You know, it's it's just it. This is about action. Uh, it's it's not about talking points. And as I speak, you either feel it or you don't. But you certainly feel the urgency of what our community needs to do. Thank you, Carlton. That's time, Dan. Uh, I w would very much like to explore it with uh, the community. I I think it is there is a lot of. Um, strong points for the idea of a stronger mayor. I think we can find a way of actually having a strong mayor and a uh, strong manager who are uh, entitled to work together. Problem is with all of the power only flowing to the city manager and the uh, mayor being given a ceremonial post and the city council actually uh, being only required to rubber stamp what the city manager gives us. I don't think that started serving the city well of late. I think we have had, uh, you know, and I'll put this in kind of geeky terms, we've had a um, economy that has been uh, going up for uh, the past 70 years. In that, we haven't really noticed when there's been extra money uh, required, and so the, oh, I can add this uh, administrative post, oh, I can add this person because it makes my life easier if you're the administrator. Okay, the citizens say, okay, well, that's just what it is. Now, as we're seeing the economy going the other direction, a lot of us are feeling like, oh my, we have to do something different. So here is where I think we have to explore a new version, which is some, and I've been looking at this, which combines the role of a stronger mayor and a city manager who does the day-to-day -day administration. Because if we don't, we're gonna end up with this bifurcation that doesn't serve the city well and increasingly puts the city manager and the city council at odds rather than making one unit. 
Thank you, Dan. So we're just about done with our forum, but we do have one more audience question, and I'd like to put it to the group. Do folks want to, oh, two more. Um, do folks want to go on for, uh, I'll have to do one, I don't think we have time for two more, but one more question from the audience before we wrap up? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. I would do um, both of them. I'm a nine-time oh, marathoner, right. so I'm okay. <laughs> We're going to need a break because we have the City Council District 1 Forum coming right up. Okay. Um, so we'll pick one. I'll just randomly, I don't know how to be random here. I'll just pick the one that came. Um, okay, this question says, the ballot is so complicated this year. Can you comment on what you recommend we look at and what you recommend we consider? Ooh, I'm not sure how you could do that. Um, Try the other one. Okay, I apologize to the question asker. I just don't think that's something that they can answer in a forum. Um, okay, this question is, did you attend the meeting of the Homelessness Task Force? Um, and I'm going to assume that means the most recent meeting? A year ago, um, during, during the previous election, the Homelessness Task Force, um, which I'm a member of, invited the mayoral candidates to um, come and meet with us because one of the candidates had, had asked to come and meet with us and in the interest of, of fairness, we asked that all candidates come and meet with the Homelessness Task Force. Um, okay, I, I need to wrap it up into a question. I'm sorry to interrupt yeah, you. The, the, so the question, the, um, the, the question the question the question is of the candidates who ran last year who attended the that meeting with the homelessness task force. Oh, I I apologize. I I don't think that's a fair question because the, they're not all the same candidates. Okay. Um, so I apologize about that, but I think um, that ends our forum for today, and I thank you all for running. Um, I would I, like I to thank give the you bridge and the Rotary Club for sponsoring this. It was an important function, so uh, our appreciation to all of you. Thank you, and I will give you each another 90 seconds for any follow-up comments, anything you wanted to say that you didn't get an opportunity, or any statements you might have for your voters. And who are we starting with now? Oh, I lost track. You're going to go. <laughs> How about we start with Dan? Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the um, gorillas in the room that is not being talked about is the relationship with the state. We are the uh, state's uh, capital city, and yet if we have another major flood, uh, we are not going to be showing off our city to the best regard for a long time. I think rather than waiting for some kind of pilot payments in lieu of taxes from the state, we have to open up a discussion with our state, with our administration, with our legislature about what is the role of your capital city. I think we have to relook at our relation to the state because they take up uh, over half of the downtown real estate, okay, and yet they are not paying anywhere close to their fair share. Okay, if we want to do things that actually have to do with uh, attention to services, the state has to be involved. If we want to do housing, there are places at the pit, there's places on the old parking lot down near uh, Bailey Avenue where housing could go in, in town, walkable, and that it is something where I think we need a new vision of how we're going to do things in the city that isn't just going on with the way things were. So that's where I would start. I wanted to leave that as an idea that uh, redefining our relationship with the state would become one of my priorities if elected, along with the, the other services that we have to keep maintaining. Thank you, Dan. Jack. Thank you. We made it through 2023. We're about to adopt a budget and elect a mayor and council for 2024. And where are we now? We have a chance to decide that 2023 will, 23 will go down in history, not just as the year of the flood, but as the year that we began to make progress facing many of our city's needs. Housing, roads, water system, fiscal stability. In, in 2023 to 2024, we made progress on all of these areas. Look at the at this council's strategic plan as de determined by the council. Infrastructure, housing, future resilience, economic prosperity, future or public health and safety. Not a vanity project in the bunch. Throughout the year, 
while we were recovering from the flood, we were also doing the hard stuff, keeping our city government going, working through the consequences and appeals from arising from the citywide reappraisal, moving forward on housing infrastructure and other initiatives vital to our city's future. 2024 will continue in this line. We've already scheduled deep dives into every one of the elements of our uh, strategic plan. So in the next several months, each month we'll have a meeting, city council meeting that will uh, be addressed to those issues, one of those issues. In the next budget year, the council will be prepared to guide our whole city government to meet our goals. I should also point out that uh, <clears throat> for as long as I've been in Montpelier, people have said, well, things would be great if we just could squeeze more money out of the state, if we could get the state to pay their fair share. In fact, the formula for the uh, payment of, in lieu of taxes program is to tax the state based on uh, the city's tax rate and based on the market value of the properties, uh, state-owned properties within the city. So thinking that we're going to magically get more money out of, out of the state and, uh, and save our budget that way is, is unfortunately, there, there's no pie in the sky that we're going to get uh, out of that. I, I agree with, I thank the Rotary and the Bridge for uh, carrying this out. I think Rotary is a great organization and uh, I'm glad to see it continues to be a vital organization for our city. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Carlton. What was the question? This is your chance to make a final statement and bring up anything that you might have wanted to talk about that you didn't get a chance to um, address the voters one more time. So I, wa I want to uh, reiterate that this is a um, cry for help, uh, not just for me, uh, but for other uh, people uh, who are watching and listening to uh, discussions that feel as if uh, we're invisible. Um, what I'm showing you right now are, these are the final notices of my apartment. Um, I have a landlord who sends me so much paper, uh, given that I've worked in Northern Power Systems and Bosch Thermal Technology. I don't understand why a phone call can't be made, um, but that's okay. So given that I have uh, experienced some issues with uh, marginalization to a point where my um, transition from truck driving after the flood into uh, walkable employment has been um, stymied. Uh, I've reached out to Downstreet and because I wanted to anticipate possibly uh, finding other homes, uh, housing. So I sent from Downstreet in the mail uh, a packet to fill out. Um, in my right mind, um, it's difficult for me to understand this. So I can only imagine what this would be like for other people in their right mind or not in their right mind to fill this packet out. Um, and so we need to really start looking at the issues from a bottom up or trickle up uh, perspective because there's so many things that are being missed uh, on a granular level for even myself. Uh, the difference is I can see it, calculate it, and then describe it to others. Thank you, Carlton. And thank you to all the candidates. Uh, voting is on March 5th at um, City Hall, and early voting has already started. There is a lot of information on the city website about how to vote. Um, please get out there and vote. Thank you. For thank being you. Here.